Before we start, I would just like to say that some of our content may be triggering for some of our listeners and viewers. If you need help, please see your GP or check out our show notes for a list of support services. While advice is given during these podcasts, this is not intended as a substitute for professional medical advice. Neither the host nor the guests of this podcast may be held responsible for any action or claims in any way resulting from the information provided. Hello and welcome to the Tough Mothers podcast and Tough Mothers TV. I'm your host, Dr. Jen. And today's interview is just, <laughs> it's so fun. I've still got sore cheeks from laughing and smiling so much. Today I'm speaking with Colette Barker and um, Colette is a mum of four and she's also the founder of Supreme Organising and the creator of its signature um, system, the 90 minute method, which basically um, works with the grain of human nature and not against it. So she looks at specifically how she can help organize your home because we're all very different and she goes into detail about that and it's um it's really really fascinating and i got a lot of good tips out of it and she also shares with us some tips that you can implement today to take the overwhelm out of motherhood on top of that because she's so fun and stuff she's not going to share her knowledge not only share her knowledge with us but she's just she's so bubbly and so hilarious she talks about how she changed from having zero children to one two three four children and um yeah like how it all changed for her and how she changed as a person which in itself is, is a great story um so i i really hope that you enjoy this today Colette's so much fun and and you will get a laugh out of this and you will definitely also get some amazing tips about how to um, organize your own home just some simple things that you can do to take out the overwhelm hi colette thank you so much for being on the show today i'm really really looking forward to speaking with you and hearing what you've got to share with us because you are a clutter mentalist and i'm just so curious about well what that means and how that came about and um just tell us a bit more about everything please <laughs> ah, jennifer right well um i am a clutter mentalist because i come with hardcore clutter roots is where I come from. So going way back, my grandmother had the typical house that you'd see on one of those hoarding programs where it's like got 12 rooms and 18 dogs and you have to walk sideways down the hallway to find the two chairs. Um, that was terrifying to go into, but we had to. And growing up as long as our house, the house that my parents and, and us seven kids grew up in, as long as we didn't get as bad as Nana's house, we were fine. <laughs> There's a lot of different levels in between fine and where Nana's house was and we lived in there. <laughs> but when people talked about Nana, they only talked about how, how messy she was and how, how much of a hoarder she was. They didn't talk about all her other wonderful qualities. It was oh. com completely eclipsed. Um, so I grew up not really fearing clutter, but knowing that things can be useful and things can be an anchor and things, you know, things can hold you down. Mm. Um, and it's really just what you, what you make of it. The choices, you get to make all the choices. You absolutely, mm. absolutely mm. do. So when I left home and I was, you know, me and my partner and, and I could have this, this beautifully tidy house all the time. And I took pride in it because I'd never had one before. And I thought I was pretty clever. <laughs> um, I, I'd have everything spit spot and my partner would come home from work later than me. And I'd just stand there waiting for him to compliment me on how awesome I'd made the house look. And then I had kids. <laughs> Well, I had my first child and then my second and then my third and then my fourth. And I couldn't achieve that anymore. <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> oh my God. I know. <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> I just, I just couldn't. I just couldn't figure out why I couldn't be this tidy, socially acceptable 
wonderful house proud person that I thought I had discovered um, after growing up and moving out of my home. Now, if you think about it, my mum had seven kids and not a lot of help. So she must have done pretty well, actually. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was comparing her to people with no children or whose children had moved out or who had all the time in the world. And we, that's something that we didn't have. So, yeah, I, I came to understand that there are so many different levels of what's okay and what makes a situation or a level of clutter or how your house is or how it isn't okay or not okay is not what somebody else thinks of it, but if it works for you. Mm. And if it's working for you, then you Mm. And if it doesn't work for you, then there's nothing to say that you can't tweak things slowly over time, one little bit at a time, and one day wake up and go, oh my goodness, look at all the cool stuff that I've created. I've got these kids and, and this is, I've found a system for this and a system for that, and that's working on autopilot and that pile in the corner is cool because I don't care about it and it's fine and so that makes it okay. Um, yeah, there's all these little, all these little things that you can do and they all start with just how you think about it first. Yeah, right. If you, yeah, if something's a threat, then you change it until it's not a threat. Yeah. And they say that comparison is the thief of joy. <laughs> so <laughs> one of the big things is to not compare yourself to others, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, superiority by comparison is just as bad as looking at somebody else and wishing you were as good as them. Yeah. Because there are so many... There are so many examples of people only seeing highlights. You only see people's highlights. I don't go showing mm. people my behind the scenes. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> who, who goes around showing people their behind the scenes? No, you put yeah. your, your, your best face on, but <laughs> other people don't so, think that that's what they're really living like. No, exactly. It's like an Instagram reel. Um, so can you talk us through a little bit your lifeline from when, so you, you were with your partner alone and you were like the domestic goddess and then you had your first child and then obviously you got a shock and ha like, what was your timeline? Cause you've got four children. How did you yeah. sort of progress in your clutter mentalist um, state from, you know, being without children to then having four children? How did that look for you? Uh, well, I, I had a bit of a blessing, which turned out to be such, such a kick in the guts. I thought it was a, a bonus and it was not a bonus. What had happened was I had worked, um, I'd worked at Plunkett for about five years. And in the Plunkett world, you know, you feed babies and you wrap them up and you put them down and they sleep for three hours and then you pick them up and you play with them and you do that whole thing again and you just do it all day. And then at night time, you put them down and they go to sleep and then you toddle off to bed and go, oh, what a hard day I've had. And then you wake up and you do it all. And, and it, looks, it looks beautiful. Yes, and it's I'd like in a movie. Yeah, yeah. I'd worked at Plunkett before I had children. Great. Good mood, Colette. That was smart. <laughs> so this is what I thought having children was. Of course, the other Plunkett staff that I worked beside, who had children, would look at things I was explaining to people and go, what has she had for breakfast? <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'd be like, no, no, this is the stuff I'm supposed to be telling them. Mm. So then I had my first baby and you'd think, oh, you'd think all that reality would come crashing down on me. But what I had was a perfect blanket baby. Oh, no. Yeah, it was born. You from must have gone, nailed it, nailed yes. it. <laughs> <laughs> See, I told you all that all you have to do. So this, this baby would would feed it would go to sleep it would not wake up 
until it's scheduled for our feed. In fact, if I had somewhere to go and I had to wake it up, I'd put this girl on my knee and I'd be stripping her clothes off and I'd be rubbing her and shaking her jelly and trying to wake her up and she would she would just sit there like a closed flower and at the dot of four hours she would wake up and say I'm ready you can feed me now where did you get her um, from was it like mail uh, order <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness and saying that she's a teenager now and you still can't get her to do anything which isn't her idea right um so that was just her personality this is how I'll be doing it and end of story Right. So I got one of those babies and I thought, oh, well, that's cool. Yeah, see, all I, so, and I wrapped her up tightly and I put her in bed and she cried for her 10 minutes and then toddled off to sleep. And um, breastfeeding was a whole nother thing. It looked good on paper. I managed to breastfeed her for 11 months, but I had rescue remedy and arnica and I had um cabbage leaves and ice packs and i'd bite on a flannel while i was mm. feeding her <laughs> sounds <laughs> nice doing... how nurturing I'm for you both <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um so that was a that was a whole other thing um but yeah then i had the next baby and the next baby taught me that everything i knew was in fact wrong everything the <laughs> lot the lot um yeah the next baby gosh we grew a whole lot I mean we died we practically died first but when we came back to life we grew a lot wow so this was a baby who didn't do anything we wanted it to do and didn't do anything we expected it to do um she would feed for she would feed for maybe from about 4 30 in the afternoon to 10 p.m she would feed every 10 minutes literally and I still had this almost the same amount of pain breastfeeding oh no not fair yeah, but, yeah. um and she would feed until 10 p.m where she would helicopter vomit it all out and then go to bed and, and then hungry. sleep all night provided we just rocked her in her hammock like this until five in the morning wow <laughs> Um, and you know, the next baby comes and people go, oh, you're really good at it now. And turns out it's a whole nother person with a whole nother personality. Yeah. Again, another, another stroppy one who only did what she wanted. Mm. Um, by this time we were, by this time I had vowed and declared in my, in my motherly tone. I wasn't getting out of bed for no bugger. I was sick of getting out of bed. Because <laughs> um, when I say they went to bed and they stayed asleep, that, that didn't count all the feeds and stuff that you get up. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, the second one that just needed a cuddle at 2 a.m. every morning until she was about four. Mm -hmm. um, I had one of those. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, I was sitting there, sitting there one day feeding the third one and, and I had, the oldest one and the second one on either side of me and I'm sitting in the middle and they're all having a good old chat at two in the morning and I'm like you need to go to sleep <laughs> and the oldest one says no this is more fun and I said you need to please be good girls and go to sleep you need to be good girls and go to sleep and the oldest one says oh like dad he's a good boy because he's the sleep hey <laughs> <laughs> yes be like dad <laughs> Yeah, 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 be like dad and I won't be as angry at you as I am with that. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the third one came along and she actually just slept in my bed with me. Mm -hmm. Not from the start, because I still was quite, you know, I had, I had my old plunket rules in my head and I thought if a baby slept in bed with me, they would die. Mm -hmm. um I was pretty sure that would happen like as soon as as soon as you went to sleep next to them I was sure that they would die because all Just the because... times that my children had been in cots or bassinets or somewhere else I'd had these terrible terrible nightmares that somehow they'd found their way into my bed I'd pushed them down to the bottom and I was holding them under the blankets with my feet this was the dream I was having 
I've had, I I had like, a similar is... dream actually, but it wasn't at the feet, at my feet. I dreamt that they crawled into my bed and I rolled onto them. Yeah. Yeah. But Just it was only my first and my problem. second. I think we were my third. Yeah. I was so sleep deprived. I never went into deep sleep to have a dream. But yeah, I, I had similar dreams and I couldn't even yeah. walk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it, it seems so logical when you're asleep. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so um, I thought, well, you know what? I'm really tired. I'm just going to feed the baby next to me. And then I fell asleep which is, a, you know, the thing you're not supposed to do. Mm. And then I did it and it was, it was bloody awesome. It was so awesome. Mm. And I, I'd have to say out of all the parenting experiences I've had so far, the breastfeeding, the seeing them get prizes, the taking them to sports things, the cuddles, everything. The best thing that I've experienced is sleeping next to my baby. Mm. <laughs> It's lovely. <laughs> yeah, it is. And even, you know, people are worried that if you sleep next to your baby, that they'll still be in your bed when they're teenagers. You know what? Sometimes my teenagers let me sleep next to them in their bed. And it's just the best thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. Not often, but they, yeah. But if, I, if I'm tired or, or they're just sitting there on their phones and I'm just desperately needing an afternoon nap, you know, it's nothing to them for me to just come and lie down next yeah. to them, have my 10 minutes sleep and then go off. Oh, cute. Um, so, yeah. So the, the third one, I sort of morphed into sleeping next to her and that gave me a little bit more energy in the daytime. Mm -hmm. And then the last one, knowing how small the bed was the last one we actually went and bought a super king size bed <laughs> while we were pregnant with the fourth one and then we were prepared we bought it for for that baby sophie we bought it for her we were prepared for when the plunket nurse asked us is she in her own bed we were like yes yes she is she is in her own bed <laughs> we're all in there but she is definitely in <laughs> It's uh, her bed that yes. we sleep in. <laughs> yes. yeah. She lets us in there. It's cool. So um, yeah, that there was there was a real a real funny evolution from doing everything by the book to begin with, because to go outside of those lines is to ruin your baby, and there might be a death involved. Mm -hmm. And then and then just to go so far out the other end to by the time we got to our fourth the sort of things that we were doing were were so different so the first one the first one slept in the cot wrapped up had a had a mosquito net beautiful big mosquito net over which was made out of the veil from my wedding oh, was, oh, oh how lovely isn't that what you see in the magazine and the last one slept um in a super king size bed with her parents <laughs> for nighttime sleeps for daytime sleeps she was a winter baby so she didn't even have blankets she slept like a starfish on the floor in front of the kent fireplace um, <laughs> and when the midwife came to check you know how things were going she just she sees this little comatose starfish in front of the fireplace and says ah subsequent children <laughs> <laughs> yeah you do wonder whether at some point they look back on photos you know of the firstborn having all these amazing things and go what happened yeah <laughs> why didn't fair. i get those yeah, yeah because exactly. they said, that's why you didn't get them <laughs> exactly um, so what else did i do differently um so what did you the, can i ask what what changed with you so you went you know you did the you were like really good and keeping your house tidy and then obviously just judging by your story of stories of how when it was when the children came along how did your house change well <laughs> my house went from still quite tidy you know in the first few weeks because really all we were doing was looking after a baby and there wasn't anyone else making a mess it was just me mm. and my partner making a mess and then as toddlers grew and more children came it turned into, let's describe it as there appears to have been a struggle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I had, um, I had children 
coming into my house and running back off to their mother and saying, Mum, why is her house like that? <laughs> it was trashed. It was absolutely trashed. Um, I had a real big philosophy then that I had taken straight from the group of ladies that I was friends with that was people before things, always. So if I was struggling to deal with the people and the things, I would pick the people and bugger the things. Yeah, that's good philosophy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and another another way to an, another way to understand it is um, sometimes we sometimes we think, well, I've got to get the washing on because that's a job that I need to do, or I've got to fill out my C because CV because that's a job I've got to do. Um, so you've got all these jobs and then the baby starts crying or the toddler needs your help or they're just bored or they're lonely and, and you're thinking, I just want to get some work done. Mm. But the thing is, they are the job. Yes. They are just as much of a job as the washing, as the work stuff, as the cleaning. They're not two different things. So going to them and leaving the washing means that you're still getting the job done. Yeah. You're still acing the job. If you can leave your house when it is a bomb site and be happy that you have taken care of the emotional and physical needs of your family, then you've aced it. You've yeah. absolutely aced it. You're so right. Um, and it's just it's not something that we're really taught very much before we have children or even while we have children, you know, and, and it would be so wonderful to spread that message. In fact, I'm going to pull that out as a quote for my social media because, <laughs> because it, it's so true and you're right. And it is a job and you've got to pick the people before the things. And if you're choosing the things before the people, then you've got it wrong. And especially if you're doing it to impress other people, right? Yes. Yes. And people will see that when they say to buy a TV, and they put their TV up, and when they saw the TV in the showroom, it was all tidy. And now their TV is is sitting in their room with all their crap around it. They think that they've failed, but yeah. now it's their TV. <laughs> it's their stuff. <laughs> so that's that's no failure. However, if things are really driving you crazy, you can pick one or two things at a time to. Um, to focus on and consider it mental health. Okay. So for some people, um, putting six hours a day into tidying, you know, honestly, it is their mental health. We shouldn't judge them for that. If that's what they desperately need to do to feel in control, that is no different from any other vice. Mm. If they want to do that, they can do that. However, that's not me. Um, I can leave. No, <laughs> no, no. Um, for example, say um, there were four little bags coming in every afternoon from school and preschool and stuff. So I just put um, four little stick on hooks on the wall, not high on the wall, not so that um, they had to take the weight of the whole bag, but just low on the wall about where the bag would sit so the bags wouldn't fall over and the kids know where to put them. So almost like they're resting on the floor. Is that what you yeah. mean? Oh, that's a yeah. great idea. Yeah. So it's if you're just a space for them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like a home. So the, the, it is so simple for the children to understand. That's what's most important. It needs to be simple for them to understand. Because if, if you're the only one who can understand something and you're the only one that a system comes to naturally, Nobody else is going to help you with that system. Mm. Nobody. Yeah, you're right. Another one, yeah, um, another really good solution I had was, um, so as they started growing up, they were all going to the same primary school. Um, so all their school uniforms were the same. And I would fold up all their clothes and I'd put them in there in their cupboards and drawers and then they'd take the one from the back at the bottom, rip it out and everything would be in a big mess. So then I just stuck their clothes in buckets, big flexi tubs. Huh. That's, that's the tops, that's the bottoms. And you know what? First up, 
best dressed. You get so, your favourite shirt. So you you had all the kids tops in one, all the kids bottoms, or just from one particular child? With their school clothes, because they were all the same school clothes. All, all the, the children's together. green tops in one bucket, all the children's black bottoms in another. That's um, awesome. It, yeah, and it saved so much. And you know what? They weren't even folded. No, well, that doesn't make yeah. a difference to them anyway. And no. school uniforms usually, I mean, generally aren't crinkle material anyway, are they? They're not made of linen. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> silk, so my silk blouse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. We don't have a silk blouse bucket. Um, we don't have a silk blouse. No. <laughs> not at this time of our lives. Because looking at that silk blouse at this time of our lives is only going to make us feel sad. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah, really no, that's a really good it. tip. So yeah, when yeah. you when you do your you do one on one consultations with with people to help yeah. them with, in their homes and to make it work for them, don't you? Yes, that's what's most important. Can you talk us because, through that a little bit? Because you you implement also some psychology behind that. Because like you said, it's not the same for every person. So Certainly not not yeah. even close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is a real bummer sometimes because wouldn't be we like easier. to just look at, yeah would you like to just see what somebody else is doing just do that and know it works that'd be great yeah, yeah. but that's, that's a fantasy um so everyone's got a different everyone's got different goals so for some families um it could be um we just want everything tidy for when dad comes home so I can feel that I can sit down for 10 minutes and you know, we can all sit down as a family and just hang out for a little bit. Or it could be, um, I'm get, going back to work and I just need some systems that that get all the housework done in half the time or less. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that I have some brain cells left at the end of the day. Otherwise, I make it, you know, I'm not a very good member of my family. I, mm, you know, mm. I can't fill up my cup if I've used up all my beans. Yeah. Um, so, for example, it could be one of the things that I do quite uh, quite often in a few houses is somebody will come home and they'll chuck their bag in the doorway and everyone will go, oh, I hate it when people just chuck their bag in the doorway. But that's a really natural place to chuck a bag. It's a really sensible place. Right beside the door, that's a brilliant storage place. Clear everything out. That's the place the bag goes. Problem solved. Oh, no right. extra work. Yeah. No extra work. And it's what you have to work with your habits, not yeah. create a whole bunch of new ones all the time. And then I guess it just gets stressful, doesn't it? So if you're like, okay, you don't put your bag at the door anymore. Instead, you're going to walk into the second room, put it in the cupboard on a hook, and people just go, it's not going to happen, especially exactly. husbands or right. not saying yeah. anything. Yeah, but... <laughs> yeah. No one's going to, no, no one does it, do they? No, well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't either. No. no. Um, so we have lots of things around the doorway that get dropped in the door. The thing is, Here's what's most important. We move things away from the doorway that are not needed by the doorway. Mm -hmm. um, if there's an ornament or, or, or a shelf or something which is actually in the way, then that's the thing that should move, not the thing that we would naturally put there. Mm. Um, so it's looking at what your natural tendencies are and it's working not with your strengths which are normally the things you can do when you're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and have a good <laughs> night's sleep it's working with your weaknesses that's awesome that's really so important so you take all your weaknesses you don't be embarrassed by them you just go you know what that's the way i want it to work so for me, my weakness is I don't want to do things at night. Anything mm -hmm. I try and do at night takes me five times as long. Mm -hmm. So I don't worry about dishes left on the bench at night. I don't worry if there's washing left to fold or even important things left to do. I know I can do anything in 10 minutes in the morning. 
because mm. I'm a morning person. Yeah. But you could turn that around at night. If you're not a morning person, then you have everything set up in the morning for you to just basically roll out of bed and fall into. Um, you know, all the kids' lunches. My kids' lunches are in the freezer. Oh, right. Ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not talking about a big array of all these different wonderful <laughs> things. Because school lunches, there's only five of them in a week. There's like 21 meals in a week. And only five of them are school lunches. That's not where I'm putting my effort. Yeah. <laughs> because who knows? Who knows what happens with their school lunches? I've been to school and seen their lunches in the rubbish bin. Yeah. So I'm not putting a whole lot of time and effort into And that. I find also with my kids a little bit younger than yours, but um, I find that often, it's even my eldest who's nearly as tall as me and he eats a lot, he doesn't eat that much at school because he's busy. They're busy yeah. playing. And so like to, to I've, I've, I'm, I was actually just thinking the other day, should I upgrade the lunches? I feel like I've been making the same thing since he started school. But it's, it's all he needs. It's like a sandwich for lunch and then he goes off and he plays you know, basketball, whatever he's playing. And so, you know, yeah, I guess just keeping it simple and also working to my weakness. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's always a way that you can, I mean, it looks like I'm justifying, but there's always an excuse. And people think of the word as an excuse. People think of the word excuse as a bad thing. I love the word excuse. It means that there's a good reason why we don't do it like that. What's your excuse? Well, here's my excuse, and it's a damn good one. So if I know that the children aren't going to eat their lunch, then I'm not going to make a whole lot of effort. I will make yeah. sure there's, we've got something there. Um, and we do have a habit of creating unnecessary stress for ourselves in motherhood, don't we? It's like, you know, even just aside from lunches and, and clutter and, and stuff, it's sort of like there's all these shoulds, should, 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 should all over ourselves in the end and everyone's unhappy. So why make yes. it harder than it needs to be? And like in my case, and this is what I was, I was having a little conversation with myself going, he's happy with what you're providing him for lunch. And, and I asked him from time to time. Sorry? He's secure with it. Yeah, exactly. And I ask him, I say, do you have enough food? He says, yes. And then I just go off, but somehow I still guilt trip myself. Maybe he's not getting enough food, but obviously he is, but we yeah. try to make things harder for ourselves than they need to be. It's quite ridiculous. Yeah. 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 But you'll see somebody else on social media say, well, like, you know, I've had to do this because my children, my child's done this X, Y, Z. So I'm going to have to do that as well. And then you think, oh, okay. Um, well, I'll give it a go, but uh, oh, it feels like pulling teeth. Well, but that's because it's not for you. Yeah. It's quite simple. Not for you. That's for them. Yeah. And your best friend could be doing something that isn't for you. You somebody in your own family. So in, in my family, um, there's a lot of different clutter personalities. Um so my um I I like stuff, but the but I look at stuff as work. So I'm always looking to get rid of everything because every book on a shelf that I know that I, I don't want to read anymore or every shirt in the cupboard that I put on, it makes me feel bad. I have learnt that feeling that comes up in my body of, of a recoiling, a contracting, um, a, a, a no feeling. I've learned what a no feeling feels like. And when mm. I see something that gives me that no feeling, it's a red flag to me. Mm. So it could be um, something the kids are eating that gives me a no feeling, or it could be um, a particular, a mess. But then what I've also noticed is there are some things that don't give me that. Mm. And they're things that society tells me they should be freaking me out. They should be worrying to me. Mm. They're just not. So it's very much so, about being in tune with your gut instinct and your feeling and really listening to what is right for you. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and when it works, it's wonderful. I'm not saying it works all the time. Mm. But when it works, it's, it's really good. And just know that I just know that I can do something and it's completely different to what somebody else does. And it's still fine. It's absolutely fine. Mm. Um, 
yeah, so things like, um, oh, gosh, I don't know. There are so <laughs> Oh, there'd be countless, I, I imagine. Yeah. 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 And, and, I've, I've and it, stopped looking. I think it's just, it's one of those, you know, I talk about matrescence quite a bit, which is the, the, trans, the transition and the transformation <laughs> from, um, from woman into mother. Not that you're not a woman anymore when you're a mother, but that transition and a lot of stuff happens. And I think one of the best things that comes out of it is I think our gut instinct gets honed and we, we, our intuition becomes stronger. And, you know, they talk about mother's um, intuition and, and, and the mother knows what's best for you, their baby. And we really need to utilize this on ourselves because the yes. messages are there, you know, so it's not just, I mean, obviously for the baby as well, but like in, in, you were saying in your case, it's just not for me, even though yeah. society says I should do that. And I think that's a, it's a really powerful gift that we've been given, but we need to tune into it because it's there. It really is. Um, I heard a really good way of explaining mother's intuition, which I have latched onto and never let go of. And a mother's intuition is, is made up of thousands of interactions that you don't even know that you are having. So you can walk past a baby on the floor and your conscious just thinks there's a baby on the floor and that's my baby. And your subconscious is taking in the way it's lying, the way it's breathing, where it is compared to where it was, how its sleeves are folded. Mm -hmm. All these tiny little things so that one day you're walking through that same room, seeing that same baby in that same spot, and somewhere in your subconscious, you're getting this message that there's something not right, and then you can fix it. And that's yeah. what the intuition is, is born of thousands of interactions that other people haven't had. Yeah. Yeah. And you won't have words right. for it. You um, just know. That, yeah. <laughs> That was mind blowing. That was, and it's not, it's not woo woo. It's not magic. It's not, you know, some sort of thing that you can't quantify. You mm. absolutely can quantify it. Yeah. No one can be out quantifying it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I love that. That's great. That's, it's mm. so true. Yeah. And it's so it's individual. Magic. It is. It is. It is. And you could pass all, on all that information, but there's something about the embedding of the knowledge that you see, you know, whether you see it or you feel it or you hear it or whatever, there's something about the, you know, going into the neuroscience about it being embedded in, in your brain as an important bit of information that you at some point need to recall that makes up the story, that makes up the, you know, the whole picture of, of what's going on. And you can't yeah, yeah. translate that into words. Like, you know, even if you explain to somebody, another mother, about the sleeves and about the way the baby's lying or whatever you just can't because it's not in you does that make sense no. do you know what i mean no. that, well what we've got to transfer that information with is language and sometimes our language is is not comprehensive enough mm. to convey what we know absolutely <laughs> but we can also use language and use we can implant ideas in our own minds and that of our families for really good effect. Mm. So um, one thing that that we do in our family is when when we have a when we have a baby, we'll give it a song. Um, I think my mum inadvertently did this to us, but didn't realise until I, her youngest, was a teenager, and I got offended when she was singing my song to someone else. <laughs> she didn't realise it was my song, and I didn't realise she didn't realise it was my song. <laughs> um, so they all had one song. Um, my sister-in-law didn't like to sing, so she had a poem. And say you're 10 minutes away from home in the car, and the child starts crying, you just sing the song. Mm. Um, I found myself in hospital with, you know, children lying on beds with all these doctors and nurses and people working on this child. What can I do? I can just sit out of range and sing their song. Mm. Um, and it makes such a huge difference. And that, th those are Jedi mind tricks. Yeah. <laughs> you just yeah well, they they are but they're not like that yeah it's it's all about how it shows how complex the brain is and the connection of the brain and the mind and the body and the 
spirit without you know the, our soul it's all so connected it really is it really is so you if you can sort of get out ahead and see a problem that might happen come up with the come up with an answer before that one thing that one thing that I used to hear other people complain a lot about and I never had to complain about I don't know how I came up with that so early but I'm really stoked I did was you know when you go and buy someone a present and you've got your child with you and the child goes back and tells that person what the present is <laughs> hasn't happened to me yet thankfully <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, children had such big mouths all, all I ever did was I said to these people, I said to these children, say I was buying my husband like a pair of shorts and they were a khaki green color. I just say, oh, better not tell dad about the green oompa we got him from the sports shop. <laughs> when we, we weren't in a sports shop, they're not oompa -lumpas. they're not exactly green. Um, <laughs> I just say, whatever you do, don't, and then you implant some other words. And you know you're going to hear those words come out while you're in the kitchen or something. You know you're going to hear them. Did it work? And, yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I could I could keep a lot of a lot of things under wraps, present wise, by uh, no pun intended, <laughs> um, by just coming up with here's what I want you to say, but but I don't want you to say it. But if you were going to, that. <laughs> That's really cool. That's really it's cool. so funny. And it's it's interesting, like you're sharing all these stories. Um, I just want to skip to your book because you wrote this amazing book about um, in case of emergency, it's called, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Have yeah. You, I bought have a you got a copy. Yay. Because of the, yeah. you know, you were saying that um, at the back, you can write little stories like that, you know, your little memories of how you, things that your children did or, or something you know, yeah, like that, you could write a note I'm to really your girls crazy. saying, when you're a mum, tell your children this story because that's what <laughs> yeah. they're going to spread. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can put anything in there. Um, and what's cool is you can omit stuff too. Um, so, so that's quite neat. Uh, you, can, you can paint a picture. Um, but yeah, so this book was originally, there were two separate books and I didn't realise that they work together and I never thought of them together. One of them was a book that I wrote down all the children's funny stuff in. My sisters are all a lot older than me. Their children have grown up and left home before I even started having any. So she said, look, here's a book, just a simple notebook. It had like Winnie the Pooh on the front or something. It was a $2 book. Write all the funny things in. I'm like, they're babies. What's, what is there to write? Oh my goodness. I've, I'm well into my second book now. Oh, Just wow. every little thing that happened <clears throat> gets a sentence. Sometimes I wouldn't get to write in my book, but I'd make sure I put it in my phone. Mm -hmm. And once every couple of months, I'd go into that file and copy it all into the book. Um, so, and when I look back at that, I would probably only have in my head three or four of those stories. And I'm looking back at stories, I can't even remember them, but they are hilarious. And it's a book that the children read too. Oh, cool. It really, it, it's fantastic. And, and then as an organiser, I, um, I had this book in mind, which, which is where you write all about your life so that, you know, if anything happens to you, you get hit by a bus, someone can take over everything, but also they've got your history. Mm. And I thought you really need to, and, and what I've done with this book is like there's, there's words and stuff on, on one side, but all the other sides are all blank. You know, every, every page, it's all blank. If you could fill up those blank things with something your grandmother told you, a funny thing that the children did. Mm. Um, oh my goodness, poo stories. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's got some great poo stories. Yes, yep. which is something you don't see coming before you have children and you have them and, <laughs> and then food becomes second nature <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it's also i suppose without sounding morbid um you know if you, something does happen to you and 
you are hit by a bus or something. All those stories are preserved and all those bits are preserved and passed on. And so, you know, God forbid your children are very little, then they know, you know, things that they did and, you know, that they probably would never know about otherwise. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, sitting around after my father died, because <clears throat> he, he thought he was never, he told us he was never going to die. <laughs> um, he was the storyteller, but he told them all orally. Mm -hmm. And when he passed on, right, now we're the storytellers. We're going to stand up in his eulogy and we're going to, oh, no, does any, did anyone... Does anyone remember any of those things he said? Oh, no. yes. Oh, oh, me neither. Oh, bugger. Okay, his favourite jokes. No, there was something about a duck. Uh, no, I don't know. <laughs> so, I mean, there's silly little things when you're alive. They just seem like nonsense. They just seem frivolous. Mm. And if anything happens to you, say you get a knock on the head and you lose some of your memory. Yeah. Or, you know you're just unavailable one day when these things are needed. They're all there. That's yeah. So, perfect. It's so important. Really. I'll put it, I'll put your website in the show notes for people because it's available for purchase on your website. Right. Um, and so people can, can have a look through and, um, and, and purchase it. But I just want to finish with one question going back to, Oh, I don't even know how far we go back, go back to, to the, 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 the the cluttering and the organizing and, and all that sort of stuff as a mother of four children yeah. and as a organizing expert, what <laughs> do you think would be the number one tip you would give mothers who just feel it's just all a bit too much right now with motherhood and the house and the everything? What, what would be your number one tip? Do you think that you would like women to know? <sighs> It's not a hard question. Honestly, <laughs> honestly, people before things always, yeah. if it's all too much and some days when it was all too much, I used to wear glasses before I got my eyes glazed and days where I'm sitting in, in piles of jobs, um, my children are crying or being naughty um, I would just take my glasses off so I could only see about yay far in front of me, put the baby on my knee and say, hey, look, if you want my attention, you're going to need to come within my vision because I can't see anything else. I'm cutting everything else out. I'm reducing my world to just what is right here around my head and around my heart. And if you want to be in there, you're welcome. And That's everything amazing. else can just get bent. <laughs> I love it. And I love it. That it was actually a physical thing. Like you had no choice. Well, I mean, you had choice to take off the glasses, but it was like, no, this is it. Anything is like, I can't. That's fabulous. Yeah. So you yeah. don't even see just, the dirty just, dishes and the washing that needs to be folded because you just have the people no, in so the little I, sphere. I, I, you know how people are always saying, you know, I, I need my me time and I need to get away and I need to, I need to go and recharge my batteries. I, um, I needed to do that sitting in the middle of it. Mm. So I needed to be able to sit in my chair, close my eyes and breathe 10 times. Sometimes I got to, sometimes I didn't. Sometimes I got to 30, which was very exciting. <laughs> sometimes I desperately needed a nap and I'd lie down and close my eyes and anywhere between eight breaths and 30 breaths, that was my nap for the day. And it would all just be so if it's too much, if the outside world is too much, just just bring it in and breathe. Go within yourself, every, yeah. Yeah, everything you need is right there and all these other outside things are trying to attack me. So <laughs> I just got to put, put my little shield up. Now I've had my eyes lasered, I can see everything all the time. It's not quite as good. <laughs> you can put on some other very strong glasses so that you don't see anymore. <laughs> I'm just having my me time put on glasses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And my eyeballs go whoop in them. Yeah. Well, <laughs> this has been an awesome conversation. Thank you. I, I've laughed so much. And um, I think, you know, the, the tips that you've offered have just have been amazing and um, so oh, simple, you. you know, and, um, and I hope that um, people who are listening will now 
also put people before things and and not worry so much but if they Definitely. would like some more help with their organizing they can contact you and i'll put the your website and your contact details in the show notes and you will help them to personally organize their life for them for their special yeah. needs yeah. yeah yeah absolutely and i'm just i'm just a person sitting here at the end of the phone if they just even if they're not sure if they need help or not there's no rules that say you can't just ring a person up and just chat to them for a bit yeah. you know what's the harm give it a go yeah <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. It's just been, yeah, it's been wonderful. And I've learned a lot too. It's fun, and, isn't um, it? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. cool. <laughs>